Hello, in today's podcast, what I'm hoping to do is talk about a recent study of ours, which has been published in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology in the past week. Um, but before I go into the detail of the study, I think it would be helpful to say something about the context in which the study has been conducted. So first of all, it's part of a, a series of studies that we've conducted over the last number of years, which are trying to understand the suicidal mind better. But crucially, we're trying to identify more specific markers of suicidal risk, which A, will hopefully improve prevention and prediction, and in addition to that, hopefully also form the basis for the development of uh, psychological interventions, which we hope will reduce the risk of suicide attempts and obviously ultimately suicide. So since the 1990s, we have been conducting work looking at future thinking. And this work builds on pioneering research that Andrew McLeod in London conducted in which he was trying to better understand how we think about the future in terms of hopelessness and how that's associated with suicidal risk. So for 30 years or more, we've known that pessimism for the future, hopelessness, is associated with suicide attempts, suicide ideation, and crucially also suicide deaths. But a key question that Andrew McLeod um, asked was, well, when we're thinking about the future, um, that can be at least two things. It could be that when we think to the future, it is that we're so overwhelmed with negative future thoughts. And it's this overwhelming pessimism uh, which is associated with, su with suicidal risk. Or conversely, it may not be to do with the overwhelming negativity about the future, but rather that one cannot think of positive thoughts for the future or reasons for living. And so we developed a task, the future thinking task, in which essentially under experimental conditions, uh, patients are asked to generate thoughts for the future. And they're asked what they're looking forward to, which are positive future thoughts. And they're asked what they're worried about. And the worrying thoughts, the negative thoughts, are negative future expectations. And in essence, you get two scores. You get a positive future thinking score, and you get a negative future thinking score. And what Andrew McLeod demonstrated in the 1990s was, was it, what seemed to be crucial about suicidal risk was, it wasn't necessarily to do with the overwhelming negativity about future expectations, but rather it was the absence of positive future thoughts. So this key finding which was, when we're thinking about uh, the future, it is the absence of positive future thoughts which seem to be particularly associated with suicidal risk. And indeed, then over a series of studies, using both case control designs and, and short-term predictive studies, we replicated that effect. We demonstrated time and again that the absence of positive future thoughts were crucially associated with um, suicidal risk. And indeed, in a paper uh, published in 2008, I think, uh, in the Journal of Affective Disorders, we looked at the relative predictive utility of the positive future thinking task compared it to the Beck hopelessness scale, a global measure of hopelessness, or a measure of global hopelessness, I should say, and we asked the question, which is a better predictor of recovery following a suicide attempt? And what we found was that in terms of the subsequent two to three months, that the absence of positive future thinking, as assessed through the positive future thinking task, was a better predictor of how suicidal somebody was in, in, the, the extent of recovery compared to hopelessness. And so there's a series of studies building nice consistent evidence demonstrating that the absence of positive future thinking is important in understanding the suicidal mind. And indeed this would suggest that if we're trying to develop interventions around the whole notion of hopelessness, that we need to focus in on the absence of positive future thinking rather than maybe the traditional focus on the negative future expectations. So that's all very promising and indeed um, we were quite pleased with the sort of the logical way in which the studies have progressed. However there were two key questions at least which had yet to be um, focused upon or addressed in this area. The first was that to our knowledge no studies had looked to see if I assessed 
future thinking say when an individual is in crisis following a suicide attempt? Is it useful in a predictive way to identify those individuals who are more likely to try and kill themselves in the future in the longer term, say beyond 12 months or say 15 months as, in, as, as the study we've, we've conducted and um, looked at? So there's a, this sort of medium to long term predictive utility was unknown. And then secondly, we've never looked at the content of the future thoughts beyond valence. So we had identified through building on Andrew McLeod's work, we had, had identified that the absence of positive was crucial. So positive valence is important in, in the suicidal context. But we'd never looked at the context, the, the context of the content of the future thoughts. So what happens if it's a particular type of positive future thoughts? So we asked a very simple question, which was, are positive future thoughts always protective? So in the study I'm going to talk about, which is published in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, is we asked those two simple questions. Has positive future thinking got predictive utility beyond the short term, say two to three months following crisis? And secondly, are the content of the future thoughts important if we're trying to understand that, that predictive utility? So to do this, <clears throat> we um, followed a sample of, I think it was 388 uh, individuals who had been admitted to hospital following a suicide attempt. And we were able to anonymously, uh, using linkage methodology, track these patients over time, in this study over the subsequent 15 months, to determine whether they had been hospitalized following a suicide attempt or had sadly died by suicide in, in the intervening period. And this is a crucial question because we have to demonstrate that it has longer term predictive utility if we're going to invest resources in trying to uh, tackle these particular positive future thoughts. So in terms of the content of the future thoughts, what we do is that at baseline in the hospital, all individuals, all patients uh, in our study completed a range of clinical measures, including depression, hopelessness, suicidal ideation, um, and a range of other factors, including, crucially, the future thinking task, which when individuals in crisis, they complete the, the, the future thinking task, and then we're able to determine the relative influence of people's scores effectively on these measures um, over time. Okay? Now, in terms of the content of the positive future thinking um, task, we used a modified and existing scale which has been used to classify positive future thinking in other studies, but had never been applied in this context. And we focused in on, on one particular type of category, a particular type of positive future thinking, which we reasoned may not always be protective. So we focused in on what are known as intrapersonal future thoughts. So they're intra, they're thoughts to do with you, yourself, and do not involve anybody else. And the way we defined these were any future positive events that you are looking forward to, which doesn't involve anybody else. So examples of these include, I'm looking forward to being more confident. I'm looking forward to being more optimistic. I'm looking forward to be, being well. So these particular specific aspirations, which are intrapersonal because they only involve you, the individual, and do not involve anybody else. Now we reasoned um, before the study started that these particular types of positive future thoughts may not always be protective. Uh, and we, we framed this in the context of the integrated uh, motivational volitional model of suicide. And in essence, the IMV model, the, the integrated motivational volitional model, argues that um, if we're trying to understand suicidal risk, um, there are a number of factors which are particularly important. Uh, and two of them uh, are worth highlighting for the present purposes. We, we argue that the presence of feelings of defeat and crucially an entrapment fundamental or part of the final common pathway to suicidal behavior. But crucially, the model um, identifies a range of factors which we believe can either reduce risk if you're feeling trapped or increase risk if you're feeling trapped. And one of those factors is positive future thinking. 
So if you're feeling trapped and you have lots of positive future thoughts that you can and, and you think you can achieve these things, the likely, likelihood of you developing suicidal thinking and translating those suicidal thoughts into suicide attempts decreases. However, when we thought about the notion of entrapment in the context of the present study, we reasoned that positive future thoughts are only going to be helpful if they're achievable, realizable. And we reasoned that in this particular um, sample of patients who'd all had tried to kill themselves previously, and they're oftentimes manifesting with pretty lifelong conditions or lifelong distress, that we, we argue that, well, what happens if your expectations are that I'm going to get better? Your expectations are that, that, that I'm going to be less depressed, I'm going to be more confident, or whatever the future expectation is. That if you have lots of these, these intrapersonal future thoughts, which over time you realize are not achievable, that we reason your risk of a, a repeat suicide attempt might be elevated. So when we tracked patients over time, what we found when we did the, effectively the univariate analysis, we just looked at which factors predicted repeat suicide attempts over the subsequent uh, 15 months, we found that patients who we saw in crisis following a suicide attempt in hospital, who were more depressed, more hopeless, more suicidal, were much more likely, unsurprisingly, to try and kill themselves in the subsequent 15 months. And indeed, we found that uh, that positive future thinking, some of the components of positive future thinking also predicted um, how suicidal you were, indeed, the suicide attempts over the subsequent 15 months. When we did the multivariate analyses and asked the question, well, of all those factors which were important if you looked at them on their own, uh, when you put them in a multivariate analysis, which factors are have the best predictive power. And what we find is that two factors predicted, um, convincingly predicted, uh, a repeat suicide attempt. The first was past behaviour. So the more uh, suicide attempts that you had in the past, unsurprisingly, the more likely you were to try and kill yourself in the future. In addition to that, we found that intrapersonal positive future thoughts, and no other types of positive future thoughts, intrapersonal positive future thoughts, predicted um, repeat suicide attempts. But crucially, it wasn't the absence of positive future thoughts which were important in this context. It was the predominance or the preponderance of. So if at baseline, a patient reported lots of these intrapersonal positive future, future thoughts, they were more likely to try and kill themselves in the future. And then the only other variable which was marginally significant was uh, suicidal ideation. So the more suicidal you were when we saw you in hospital, the more likely you were to try and kill yourself. So taking these findings together, we think um, there are a number of important implications. I think what they suggest, first of all, is that uh, positive future thoughts have an important role to play if we're trying to understand suicidal risk. But crucially, the picture is much more complex than what we originally envisaged. So 10 years ago, we thought, it was all about the absence of positive future thoughts. And indeed, there is some evidence that, in general, the absence of positive future thinking is important. But what this study adds to the research um, evidence is that we need to look at the content of the positive future thoughts. And what our data suggests is that positive future thoughts are not always protective. And indeed, intrapersonal future thoughts, this particular type of future thinking, may indeed be uh, deleterious. So if you have lots of positive future thinking of this particular type, and the hypothesis is that these positive future thoughts are not achievable, it may compound the existing problem. And according to our theory, we would believe that that increases the likelihood. Um, it, it makes the feelings of entrapment even worse, potentially. And then thereby increases your risk of, in this case, repeat suicide attempts. So an obvious question then is, well, what are the clinical implications of this study? I think what they suggest is, um, as noted already, is that we should not just treat positive future thoughts as uniformly positive. And part of perhaps the clinical assessment is to try and assess 
the extent to which those positive future thoughts are achievable, realistic. Um, because I think, it, I think it is important to um, try and assess positive future thoughts and improve positive future thoughts in general. But if they're not achievable, part of the, the challenge then is to look at how one responds. So there's different ways in which um, we can respond. Uh, we can look at ways in which we assist or um, support an individual in achieving these expectations. Or if the expectations are genuinely not achievable, well, part of it perhaps is looking at acceptance, um, recognizing that there are things about ourselves that we can't change. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to think about how we respond such that it doesn't become debilitating, such that it doesn't contribute to the feeling of, of entrapment, which we know are fundamentally important to understanding suicidality. We need to look at um, also the consistency of these thoughts. Now, one of the things we couldn't do in our study was look to see whether these thoughts fluctuated over time. So we assessed them at one period of time in crisis. So all we can say is when asked in crisis, these are the answers people gave, and this is the effect over time. So we don't know how they fluctuate in crisis. And people with different mental health backgrounds may have different levels of fluctuation. They may be very stable in some individuals, or they may really come to highs and lows and change markedly through a distress cycle, for want of a better term. So what I think the implications are, then to summarize, are that it's important that we assess the different types of positive future thoughts in this context. Crucially, if there are lots of these intrapersonal, um, involving only yourself future thoughts, it's important to uh, assess the achievability and, and how realistic these um, positive future thoughts are, and there are different ways, as I've mentioned, in which one can respond. And that, that should be an integral part of perhaps the, the assessment process, is what I would argue. And then, again, more research is required in time to look at how these positive future thoughts change over, over the lifespan, uh, change in individuals with different clinical backgrounds, and crucially, and crucially, we don't know yet how they respond to particular types of intervention. We think these are pretty exciting um, findings um, in a high-risk group, large sample of, of patients who um, had tried to kill themselves previously. And what we think these findings point to is the utility of looking at psychological markers of suicidal risk. In particular, in this context, uh, a specific type of cognition, cognition which relates to the future. And crucially, and absolutely fundamentally important, is it gives us, we hope, a basis for developing interventions to, to um, reduce risk of suicide attempts. Now, the key thing is this is only one factor. We know that suicidality is complex. We know that the pathways to suicide involve psychological, clinical, biological, social, and, and cultural factors. So we're just focusing in on one potential mechanism of, of risk. But it's crucial we do is through the systematic science, and it's this systematic science of building evidence, asking questions and finding answers to them, that hopefully will lead to the opportunities for developing interventions, but increase the likelihood that these interventions, are, if, if they're based on sound science, are much more likely to be successful.